Good Tuesday afternoon. Welcome to today's edition of NCSA Live. My name is Danny Koenig. I am a director of recruiting here with NCSA, Next College Student Athlete. Today I am joined by Philip Wells. Phil, what's going on, man? Oh man, excited to be here, Danny. It's been a little bit of a little bit of time since I've joined you on a Facebook Live. I cannot be more excited. It's been a minute, man, and the summer's been good. We got the Olympics going on, watching Team USA right now beat up on Canada in water polo. So obviously a lot of good things going on, but uh, we want to help these people still continuing to understand the recruiting process as things change. So I uh, just want to acknowledge here today that we are uh, live on Facebook. We are live on Twitter. We are live on YouTube. We will be taking questions at the end of this. This is about uh, knowledge for you guys. So uh, we want to help you with that process. But uh, today we're going to obviously start with the topic before we get to that Q&A, as we always do. Uh, we will be talking about how to use the NCAA recruiting calendars to your advantage. Uh, so we'll be talking about the evaluation period, the contact period, the dead period, the quiet period, all these terms that get thrown around. And we want to define those and start to talk a little bit about how you can use those things. If you guys are new to this program, if you guys are new to NCSA, that is short for Next College Student Athlete, we are the world's largest, most trusted online resource for college coaches to identify and evaluate prospective uh, collegiate talent. We're talking high schoolers. Anybody 13 and up uh, through high school can use our network to build an online recruiting profile, gain visibility to every college coach in the country. Excuse me. Uh, we do work with 37 NCAA sports. Uh, including sports at the NAIA level, the junior college level. So uh, thank you for being here with us. Uh, like I said, drop those comments in, uh, drop those questions in. We'll get those towards the back half of the show. But Phil, today we're talking about NCAA recruiting calendars, all the fun stuff that everybody really needs to do uh, to know about here. So um, we'll talk about the NCAA recruiting guide and, and talk a little bit about finding your sport in the D1 and D2 calendars. But let's talk about what are the NCAA recruiting calendars. Phil, why don't you fill us in? Absolutely. So speaking of D1, D2, that's where it applies. The NCAA recruiting calendars are basically calendars that outline when college coaches at the Division I and Division II levels can start proactively reaching out to student athletes, proactively reaching out to recruits that they may want to evaluate. Now, although we have these calendars in place, typically they don't necessarily correlate to when the student athlete starts the recruiting process. Typically, we see student athletes start the recruiting process far before the recruiting calendars outline. Okay, within a recruiting process every year at this point, we have it started starting earlier and earlier. Um, we've even gotten to the point where as early as eighth grade, even prior, families, student athletes are starting to take proactive steps. We see these steps from anywhere between Again, researching colleges, making sure you're getting ahead of the game when it comes to NCAA eligibility. We've seen families, as crazy as it sounds, as early as eighth grade, even proactively reaching out to college coaches. So again, while the NCAA recruiting calendars very much mandate, very much outline the specific time periods where college coaches can start being proactive, can start reaching out to athletes, Again, as a student athlete, we're even getting getting ahead of it prior. You know, we're doing everything we can way ahead of time. That way, when coaches are able to start reaching out, we're first in line. Yeah, I mean, the NCAA considers you a recruitably student, uh, recruitably aged student athlete at 13 years old. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this. There are some restrictions for those coaches being able to communicate their interest to 13 year olds. Uh, but there are certain instances where college coaches can communicate their interest as early as freshman year. So um, just because as we go through these terms, just because these coaches may be restricted from actually expressing their interest in you, it doesn't mean they're not using NCSA's network to identify and evaluate prospects starting as young as 13 years old. So again, if you are one of those student athletes aiming to be found by college coaches, uh, get going with one of those profiles, whatever your sport is, again, 37 sports, uh, make sure that you have that kind of exposure for college coaches that are using our network to do their early recruiting. But uh, certainly want to touch on some key terms uh, in the NCAA recruiting calendars, right? We're going to start with the evaluation period. So the NCAA evaluation period is a specific time. Uh, it's a specific time of year when college coaches are basically allowed to watch an athlete compete uh, in person or visit that person at their school. Um, coaches on the flip side are not allowed to communicate with that athlete or their parents off 
college campus, right? So colleges can, uh, excuse me, college coaches can sit in the stands um, during a recruit's practice or a game or, or visit that recruit school. But um, it really is is that coach's opportunity. It gives them a chance to talk to that uh, athlete's coach, maybe teacher's guidance office, right? Go in there, make sure that athlete is doing well in the classroom or is going to be an eligible uh, academic student. Um, and really what that coach is trying to do in the evaluation period is just get a better understanding of that student athlete's character. They're just trying to figure out if there's someone that they want to actively pursue and spend some time on to get to know that person better. So typically college coaches after that visit, the coach might call or email the recruit if that's permissible to let them know about their experience at that school, uh, you know, at that game, at that practice and the conversations that they might be having with their coaches or the guidance office or so. So the evaluation period is a big part of this for college coaches. And I was talking to some coaches uh, at a softball event recently. Um, and a lot of these coaches are, they go about it in slightly different ways, but what they're really trying to evaluate is the personality of that student athlete. So there are times when they're gonna be evaluating games and what you're doing on the field, but quite frankly, through NCSA's network, they can evaluate your grades and your ability through transcripts and, and uh, video. Sometimes those coaches are using that evaluation period to watch warm up, right? And say, hey, is this person on time? Are they organized? Do they have their act together? Are they really about their business right now? So evaluation period, again, it's just a time where college coaches are actually gonna see what you're doing to figure out if you're that type of person that they wanna continue communication with. Phil, let's talk a little bit about the contact period here. Fill us in. That's really what we're aiming for is to get to that contact period. So Phil, what's going on there? Yeah, contact period is when we get a little bit more excited about things. As a student athlete, this is a really good sign, and it has some similarities. There's some parallels, absolutely, uh, when it comes to the contact period um, and a lot of the different periods that we're going to discuss today and that we've discussed uh, thus far. But looking at the contact period, it is just as it um, sounds. College coaches are able to visit a student athlete, able to visit a student athlete's family, okay, at the high school, maybe at their home. Okay, and unlike, you know, the, the previous period, unlike the evaluation period, this is when a college coach is able to actually speak with that family, speak with that student athlete directly. This is typically reserved for that college coach's top recruits, for those listed a little bit higher on that prospect list. Because this is that time as a college coach where you're looking to actually meet with the family and get a gauge not only as to – hey, is this a, a, a good athlete that may be a good fit for my program? But you're able to actually dig into the weeds now as a college coach. You're able to pick up, on, pick up on things in person. Yeah, at this point, you may have heard from counselor. You may have heard from coach. Okay, as a college coach, at this point, you may have spoken with one of the teachers. Now it's time to actually hear from the source. Now it's time to conduct that conversation directly with the family. And the college coach is looking to, again, in person, evaluate just some of the things that align with their program. This is oftentimes what leads to scholarship offers, or it can very much potentially mean or lead to not being a good fit for either party. So this is a really important factor for college coaches when it comes to solidifying their recruiting lists, knowing what kind of recruits are a good fit for their program, both academically and athletically. But even on the flip side, this is a really important period for the family, for the student athlete. Because again, when it comes to college, this needs to be a mutual fit. You need, as a student athlete, you need to be a great fit for the college coach in the school. But guess what? That college, that coach, the culture of that college, that needs to be a good fit for you as well. So during the contact period, if you're sitting down with the college coach, this is a time period to soak it all in. This is a time period to get a grasp of that coach's personality as well. Get a grasp of potentially how you're going to be led the next four years or in a four-year period in college. So for sure, overall in the contact period, it's a really important period where things get a lot more serious from a college coach standpoint when it comes to their evaluation mechanisms and the way in which they report back to their schools to see how strong of a fit you are for their program. But don't, don't um, avoid the importance as a student athlete either because it, it's, it, it holds the same level of importance when it comes to going into these conversations throughout the contact period to gauge that college coach as well, engage that college. Yeah, I mean, that's what it's about. It's about relationship building. But again, make no mistake, the day that college coaches can pick up the phone and call you is not the day that recruiting starts. 
right? There's a lot of groundwork that needs to be laid before you actually get to the contact period. And again, there are certain division levels uh, where those coaches are going to be able to contact you in advance. You know, we're very focused on NCAA Division One, Division Two, and the restrictions there. But you know, if you're aiming to earn a scholarship at an NAIA school, those coaches can contact you in your freshman year. So go back to NC, uh, NCSA's website, find your sport, uh, figure out which division level you're targeting, and you can learn a little bit more uh, about those communication restrictions and uh, you know what conversations you might be able to have with a college coach. Um, moving on here, two terms that we need to define that we've been talking a lot about here, certainly over the pandemic. Uh, there was some makeshift uh, dead period, quiet periods there with the NCAA, uh, just trying to help them navigate COVID. So again, these are terms that we've heard, both dead period and quiet period. But uh, the most restrictive of all the recruiting periods is the NCAA dead period. So during the dead period, coaches just can't have any in-person contact with recruits. Uh, or their parents. So basically, in other words, coaches aren't allowed to talk to recruits on college campuses or at their school, at a camp. I mean, even the grocery store, if you bump into them, right? I mean, it's just you can't have any person uh, in-person contact, which again is something that we saw for an extended period of time here over COVID. But while the term dead period kind of seems a little bit scary and like there's no recruiting going on, that's actually not the case. Uh, it's really just that in-person component because athletes and coaches are still allowed to communicate uh, by phone, by email, social media, you know, those uh, digital communication platforms. So uh, dead period really just relates to the in-person, uh, very, very restrictive there, uh, kind of a protection of the athlete sort of thing. But the other term that we talked a lot about, this applied for the Division II schools over the pandemic for quite some time, is the quiet period, uh, the NCAA defining the quiet period um, as a time when a college coach may not have face-to-face -face contact with a college-bound student athlete or their parents. Um, off college campus, right? So they can't go evaluate them at their uh, at their school. Uh, they can't go to a camp off the uh, off their own campus. So basically, to break it down, the NCAA quiet period is a time when you can talk to college coaches in person on their college campus. Uh, you know, that's that's kind of what we need to be aware of there. The difference between the dead period and a quiet period is that um, coaches can talk to that person in in person on their respective campus. So, um, you know, certainly terms that you want to be aware of and in, in that calendar, understand when those times are, sort of plan around that and your communications. Um, those quiet periods, dead periods they don't last very long, but you also don't want to be in violation of communicating with the coach uh, in those quiet or dead periods. So um, last thing that we want to tackle here, Phil, the NCAA recruiting guide. I think this is something that everybody should keep in their bedside stand, right? This is something that you got to be aware of and you need to know the rules uh, and basically plan for that around those rules in your your uh, pursuit of college athletics here. But uh, Phil, talk to us a little bit here about the NCAA recruiting guide. Yeah, as much as we would all like to claim or, or show forth our expertise, there are so many rules, so many periods, so many different things that applies to, you know, different student athletes. We have to stay abreast of this kind of stuff. But Danny, I love the aspect of keeping this um, – recruiting guide by our bedside. And it's exactly that. It's a guide that comes in the form of a booklet of information. And typically every year we see this distributed to, you know, student athletes, to families, to coaches, teachers, uh, counselors. We see this distributed to a myriad of different leaders as well as student athletes and families to make sure they can be abreast, to make sure you can be abreast of what's going on in the recruiting process. Ex specifically when it comes to the recruiting guide, it very much outlines what can be going on in the recruiting process with a student athlete and a college coach in reference to the year in which they graduate. Okay, every year is a little bit different. You know, of course, a senior in high school can receive a lot more from a college coach than a freshman in high school. Again, it starts either way once you turn 13, but it's very important that you follow certain recruiting guides and again, that booklet of information where it's all collected for you so you can know when to expect what based on your grad level, based on your grad year. Now, alongside the recruiting guide, we should absolutely be paying attention to the recruiting calendars. OK, looking at the different terms that we've went over, whether it be, you know, starting with evaluation all the way down to the quiet period. We need to know that, too. OK, it's very important. We know that because that also very much determines how proactive we can be in certain instances. 
that very much determines, okay, not only knowing what can be happening in a certain grad year, but what time of year. Okay, we have to also know our recruiting uh, calendars to make sure during certain periods, we're not stepping out of turn. To make sure during certain periods, we know what to expect from a college coach. So ultimately, no matter where you are in the recruiting process, no matter what your grad year is, no matter what level you're currently in, eighth grader or a senior, you need to be very much sharp. You need to be very knowledgeable on both the recruiting guides as well as recruiting calendars so you can always know what's going on in the recruiting process for yourself as a student athlete, but also for the college coach perspective as well. So it can be yeah. a lot. 100%. This is about walking in step with what college coaches are doing and making sure that you're where you're supposed to be in the recruiting cycle based on those rules. So if you're a rising junior and you're able to have a conversation with a college coach over the phone, understand that college coaches are reaching out to their top prospects and having those 10 to 15 minute calls to learn more about that athlete. And if you're not at that point, something's got to change. So that's really where the structure of the NCAA recruiting calendar is really going to come into play for you, where you need to know those things based on where you should be uh, in your grad year, your recruiting cycle. So uh, I do want to get to some questions that obviously could be about what we're talking here today. Some of these periods, these terms, uh, you know, dead period, gray shirt, red shirt, right? Or it could be uh, anything that you're wondering about the recruiting process. So Phil, let's see if we can uh, educate the people here. I'm interested to see what we've got. Uh, hopefully, Always an exciting time. <laughs> Any tips for late rising 2022? So, Phil, these will be our uh, rising seniors by no stretch of the imagination. Are all doors closed for our 2022s? But uh, in your estimation, what are some of the things that a 2022 can be doing to get back on track? Yeah, I think the first thing is about mindset. I think it's about making sure you're going into it with a re very realistic view. And that realistic view doesn't necessarily mean close the doors on any, any stretch, close the door on anything. But we do want to be prepared to open more doors. We do as a rising senior. And again, that, that means being a senior in, in some cases less than a month. That absolutely means we have to go into the rest of the process with the open mindset. Meaning if we were only looking at D1 before, now it's maybe time to open the door to Division II schools. If it was only D1 and D2 before, now it's maybe time to couple in some NAIA, some Division Three, maybe junior college. We want to be extremely open as a 2022 prospect. And also the other aspect of it, more tangible, is actually reaching out to college coaches, being proactive, and making sure you're very realistic while you're proactive. There's no more time to, as a senior, you know, gradually step into this process. When we're reaching out to a college coach, make it intentional and make sure you have an action step really surrounded behind it to gauge if this is going to be a relationship with that college coach in that program. If not, you want to move on to a program where you had that opportunity. Yeah, so I would say just in three succinct steps. First, start and build an online recruiting profile. So you can do that for free with NCSA. That's going to give you exposure to every college coach in the country. And you never know what happens there, right? You got to take that first step. You can download our app and actually build a profile that way. Second thing, schedule a recruiting assessment with NCSA. Right? That's a third party evaluation to say, look, what do you want to accomplish out of this process? Where are you now and how can we get you there? So when Phil talks about that game planning session, it's a simple 45 minute phone call, mom, dad, athlete together saying, look, let's figure this out together and give you some things to start working on. So that's another avenue that you can utilize uh, to learn a little bit more about what you need to be doing. And then number three, you got to get to work. Just like Phil was saying, you got to keep your options open. You got to cast a wide net to figure out who might be interested in you. And you have the responsibility as a rising senior to drive that process forward. So build that profile, schedule that recruiting assessment. We'll help you game plan, figure out what your options might be. And then number three, you got to put in some work because at this point you might be a little bit behind and we need to spend some time figuring out what those, uh, those opportunities might be for you moving forward. But appreciate the question, Michael. That was a really good one. Uh, next question here. Stefania, when does 2023's men's soccer get serious as far as coaches starting to reach out and taking you personally? Well, Phil, we know 2023's right now are our rising juniors. What's going on with men's soccer for our rising juniors right now? Yeah, so really important time period right now. Actually being past the June 15th date, college coaches, as far as the seriousness of it, it is now. College coaches are able to start reaching out. They've been able to start reaching out since June 15th. And we're also in a period where visits are on the rise. Okay, visits are on the rise. So the short of it is, 
now is very much the time to be serious. If you haven't received phone calls from certain college coaches or any coaches in, in that manner, be proactive. Now is the time where your efforts towards reaching out to coaches will be returned because they are very much in that period where they can be proactive right along with yourself. Yeah, it's go time. There's no doubt. And I was a division one college coach. I was a recruiting coordinator. That date when college coaches can start to reach out is a huge date of communication. It's this big explosion date where I really do want those athletes that I've been tracking for a year or more to know of my interest. And I'm trying to move things forward in that relationship by scheduling phone calls, by trying to get that athlete to campus and make sure they have a good experience, really get the full picture of what I'm able to offer them as both a student and an athlete. So for you rising juniors at this point, you know, if you don't have a sense for where your interest might lie, or if you don't have that target list of schools and haven't started to let those coaches now, again, a good starting place. You don't want to fall behind in this process and have these coaches build relationships with similar student athletes in which they're interested and have you come sauntering in, you know, six months later where those coaches are going to say, look, I appreciate what you're doing and you would be a great fit, but we've been talking to 10 athletes over here in your same position in your grad class, right? So don't get caught behind. You do have responsibilities in this process. And this is the exact right time as a rising junior to start putting yourself out there proactively and aiming to have those conversations with college coaches. It's okay to ask them for that if that's something you're really interested in and want to know more. So uh, appreciate that question. That's a good one, very timely for some of our 2023s, just thinking about going back to school and some of the things they need to do this fall. Phil, let's get to another one here. This one from Anthony. How am I going to be recruited from far country and when will NCSA start? So this is an international student athlete. We work with international student athletes every single day. Again, you don't have to be from the major hubs here in the US to be seen by college coaches you can start an online recruiting profile and gain that visibility to college coaches here in the country from abroad. So that would be a starting place. Again, when, in terms of timing, we work with anybody 13 years and older. Uh, we are NCAA compliant in that regard. So uh, this is about being proactive, putting your information out there, making sure that college coaches can find you. But the other layer to this, Phil, and I know you've worked with this one-on-one, -on -one, these international students, they are gonna have to work a little bit harder to make sure that they're communicating their interests to the right college coaches, slightly different path. What are some of the things that you have seen from an international student athlete trying to get recruited here in the United States? Absolutely, I wanna reflect upon what you just mentioned, Danny, you have to work a little bit harder and it's not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but we just have to embrace that. We have to be realistic. We have to know that a college coach who's interested in you may not be able to you know, drive up the street and, and, and check out the high school, check out a practice. So with that being said, proactive is the word. Proactive is the word. That is the go-to. As an international student athlete, you have to make sure that coach knows that you want this thing. You have to make sure that you're reaching out and being proactive, reaching out to that college coach more than a student athlete who may be in the same state. You know, you have to make sure that a, you're reaching out to a college coach more frequently. B, you have very good highlight video. That is going to be a stressor, okay? If a college coach can't, again, readily visit you, they need to make sure they can see you digitally. They need to make sure they can see you in game, film, in, game in competition, in tournament. And what's also going to be extremely helpful from the video front, from an international perspective, is making sure you also have practice footage. You know, we want game film as well as making sure you can show how you move just as, a, as an athlete. So, again, making sure you're proactive, making sure you have video, and also just making it easy on that college coach. You know, it's already about making sure they can evaluate from afar. So make it easy on them. You know, when it comes to grades, get that college coach those transcripts. Don't make it a pain for that coach to have to really jump through hoops to figure out if you're eligible to even play. Make sure you get those transcripts over and open up that conversation and dialogue between NCAA eligibility. So the short of it is, again, making sure you're being proactive, reaching out more than ever, making sure you have some really good video and making sure you're making it easy on that college coach by getting those transcripts over. And then last thing, schedule that recruiting assessment. Talk to somebody at NCSA, game plan a little bit. You don't have to do this by yourself. And you also have options to get help from NCSA throughout this process. So for instance, going back to something that, you know, Phil had said, video, it's going to be essential. That's how coaches are going to be able to evaluate you 
because they can't invite you to their camp here stateside. So um, if you need help putting together video, that is an option for you through NCSA, along with a whole bunch of other things. But um, that would be my big suggestion is talk to somebody at NCSA, schedule that recruiting assessment with your family, will help you game plan for the future. So I want to get to two more questions here, and then we'll get to our shout outs at the end. Um, this one from Tanya, what if my 2023 daughter, rising junior, didn't quite have the golf scores in the past, but is now just starting to score low. Should she still reach out to her target schools? Phil, I am a big advocate of, of projecting towards college, right? Anticipate that you're going to be that college level athlete. Do not wait to start the recruiting process until you're the finished product. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. There's nothing better. And I wasn't a college coach, Danny, but I'm sure you can speak towards it. And I'm sure that, you know, it, it goes milestones here i know when i was being recruited it played off big it, it paid off big time for me just being able to show a time period of progression showing where you started from in those scores and maybe where they're at now if you can show that progression yes it shows that college coach where you are now which is the goal but it also shows the dedication the grit the hard work that you've put in during the time period and just like danny you talked about in that projection it shows that, hey, you wanted this thing from the start. You know, you may have not have been where you quite needed for that potential level or for that potential program. But guess what? You worked for it. And you did what it took to get there. So it's nothing better than showing just that uh, time period of progression. Absolutely. Totally. Um, one of the phrases that I always throw out there that I think is true to this day and it's going to be true forever, coaches love hustle. Coaches have spots on their roster for hustlers, right? And if you can say, look, coach, I know I'm not quite where I want to be now, but here's the ways in which I'm hustling. I want to be this good. I think that says a lot more about you as a person, you know, versus just your ability, just having good golf scores or, or whatever the, the statistic is to say, coach, I care enough about this to really hustle for you for the next year. And here's this improvement. That's exactly what Phil was saying that you want to basically show that you've made some progress and coaches are going to say, look, if they can do that in a year, what can they do for me in four? You know, how can I work with this athlete? Uh, but again, that subtext saying like this person really cares about their craft. That's the type of person that coaches really want to work with. So if you can kind of prove to coach that you are a hustler and that you bring something to the table that isn't just having good golf scores, that's going to go a really far way. But again, you can't wait to be that finished product to communicate to college coaches what you're doing now to become that finished product. So understand that that's going to have some value for coaches as well. Really good question. All right, let's get to one more here and then we'll do some shout outs. This one from Troy. My son was invited to a visit uh, to visit a college while he was at a national seven on seven tournament. Uh, Phil, I think we, yeah, we'll be talking about football here. So should he contact the coach about a date? Or will the coach contact his high school about a visit? Um, kind of depends on grad year. It kind of depends on the division level that we're looking at. Um, Phil, what's your thought here? I mean, you have experience here. What's what's your thought? Yeah, so it definitely depends on a number of different variables from, again, grad year to even division level. But whenever faced with this kind of decision, proactive is always the go-to. And you want to get ahead of it. OK, if you know that this is in your mind frame, get ahead of that coach. You're going to impress that coach, assuming they're in a period where they can proactively reach out to you and they can respond. Get ahead of it. OK, reach out to the coach prior. Reach out to the coach ahead of time. And two things can happen out of that. One, that's going to excite that coach because it's going to let them know that you're on top of it. And you're getting ahead of it. And maybe that coach is already looking to respond anyway. Now, the other side of that is. Maybe they can't respond just yet, but even if they can't, now guess what? That coach is going to see it, and now we can tally you down as a potential prospect that they're, that we're going to see really soon or that we just saw. So it's a number of different ways to attack it, very much depending on the different variables amongst division as well as, um, you know, the, the time and placement of everything. But the main go-to here is making sure you can be proactive and getting ahead of it before the coach. It's just going to impress them. Yeah, good stuff. Appreciate that. So let's uh, let's get to some shout outs here, some commitments. So we like to celebrate those that have been through this process, really struggled through the adversity, had these same questions that you guys had at some point or another. 
and they've found success. So we want to shout out the people that have reported their commitment back to us. Uh, and that's really something to celebrate. That's what we're doing this for. So um, let me pull up my notes here. I don't want to uh, miscategorize anybody. Uh, but first and foremost here, um, we got Aria. She is a lacrosse player. Phil, I'm struggling to find my notes. Hang on. Oh, here we go. Okay. Lacrosse player from Sterling, Virginia. Here we go. She is leaving Virginia. She's coming to Colorado. She's going to Colorado State uh, Pueblo. That's in the RMAC, the Rocky Mountain Athletic Conference. But a big thing to shout out about this student athlete in particular, she built that really nice recruiting profile because she had good information on there that college coaches were searching for. She actually showed up in a thousand, almost a thousand independent searches. For college coaches looking like her or looking for athletes like her. So in my mind, she can see that through our network. And if you're an athlete that wants to go play college sports, there is nothing more empowering than saying, look, I know college coaches are searching for athletes like me. Um, so to really kind of push that forward and make this process work for you that can give an athlete a lot of confidence. So um, shout out there to Ari if they're going through the process and finding success. Awesome. Love that, Danny. And we got another one coming up here. Riley, a knees winder. Very, very special shout out here coming coming up towards Riley. A um, lot of things to speak towards for Riley. I want to talk more so on a proactive basis um, from Riley and, and family. They started this process overall, again, back in 2018, as far as where their recruiting profile came or, or came about into our network. Again, through a lot of hard work, even battling through a pandemic. We all know, again, how much the pandemic effect, affected baseball. Riley was still able to battle through. You take a look at his profile, he logged into it almost 500 different times, updating things for college coaches, reaching out to college coaches, making sure they had the most accurate information so they can always be on top of the game for him as a potential recruit. That speaks volumes towards the power, not only of the network and his profile, but just the power of being proactive and really taking control of the recruiting process. The other thing noteworthy about Riley is, and it really correlates to the question we had amongst, you know, showing a timeline of progression. Again, like, like, like we talked about, Riley started this thing back in 2018, getting ready to commit or just committed to Grace Christian University. Riley had film back in 2018, and he just posted some film two months ago. He has four different videos of progression shown on his NCSA profile. You think that's enough for college coaches? Absolutely, in terms of getting a sample size of, who Riley is as a student athlete in, on the field, in game, as well as in practice. So again, I definitely wanted to just give a special shout out to Riley. And again, this is a family um, overall from the Michigan area, put a lot of work in and landed a Michigan school. So again, shout out to Riley going over to Grace Christian University, awesome program and couldn't be more happy. Success stories. And the way you're talking about Riley, he's the kind of kid that I would want to recruit as a former college coach. So appreciate the work he put in there. Uh, last but not least here, Sophia Bianco. She is from Maryland. She's from Pasadena, Maryland. She's going to play softball at MIT. That is Massachusetts Institute of Technology, one of the premier engineering schools in the country. Not an easy task to get into school there because they are school for first and athletics not first. So um, I believe too, uh, they're out of the new Mac, which is the New England Men's and Women's Athletic Conference. And MIT, their official mascot is a beaver, I think. Uh, but they are the engineers, of course. Why wouldn't they be the engineers? Of course. Sophia going on to get a great education at MIT, going to continue playing her softball career. That's what this whole thing is about. You know, finding that right fit and making sure that you can push forward for four years with absolutely everything that you want to experience in college. So, uh, Shout out to those guys. Congratulations on those accomplishments. Next week, we will be back here with an extraordinarily important topic. We'll be talking about the NCAA Eligibility Center, right? So all those things that you need to earn a scholarship, uh, prove your uh, amateur status, certainly make sure that you're pacing uh, academically to be eligible to participate. So that's something you guys are not wanna uh, gonna wanna miss next week with the Eligibility Center. But Phil, Always good to see you here, man. Appreciate your wisdom. Absolutely, uh, Danny. Couldn't uh, couldn't be more happy to really join you and making sure we can just enlighten some of the folks on this exciting, um, yeah, tedious process in some cases, but very exciting overall and very much work to pay off. It's fun. Not everybody gets the shot. So thanks for being here, y'all. Appreciate the questions, and we will see you guys here again next week. Take care.